Chapter Twelve of Fifty Years in Chains or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fifty Years in Chains or the Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. Chapter Twelve. After this, the fishing season passed off without anything having happened worthy of being noticed here. When we left the fishery and returned to the plantation, which was after the middle of April, the corn and cotton had been planted, and the latter had been replanted. I was set to plow with two mules for my team, and having never been accustomed to plowing with these animals, I had much trouble with them at first. My master owned more than forty mules and at this season of the year they were all at work in the cotton field, used instead of horses for drawing plows. Some of the largest were hitched single to a plow, but the smallest were coupled together. On the whole, the fishery had been a losing affair with me, for although I had lived better at the landing than I usually did at the plantation, yet I had been compelled to work all the time by night and by day, including Sunday. For my master, by which I had lost all that I could have earned for my own benefit, had I been on the plantation. I had now become so well acquainted with the rules of the plantation and the customs of the country where I lived, that I experienced less distress than I did at my first coming to the south. We now received a shad every Sunday evening with our peck of corn. The fish were those that I had caught in the spring, and were tolerably preserved. In addition to all this, each one of the hands now received a pint of vinegar every week. This vinegar was a great comfort to me. As the weather became hot, I gathered lettuce and other salads from my garden in the woods, which, with the vinegar and bread, furnished me many a cheerful meal. The vinegar had been furnished to us by our master, more out of regard to our health than to our comfort, but it greatly promoted both. The affairs of the plantation now went on quietly until after the cotton had been ploughed and hoed the first time after replanting. The working of the cotton crop is not disagreeable labor, no more so than the culture of corn, but we were called upon to perform a kind of labor than which none can be more toilsome to the body or dangerous to the health. I have elsewhere informed the reader that my master was a cultivator of rice as well as of cotton, Whilst I was at the fishery in the spring, thirty acres of swamp land had been cleared off, ploughed, and planted in rice. The water had now been turned off the plants, and the field was to be ploughed and hoed. When we were taken to the rice field, the weather was very hot, and the ground was yet muddy and wet. The ploughs were to be dragged through the wet soil, and the young rice had to be cleaned of weeds by the hand and hilled up with the hoe. It is the common opinion that no stranger can work a week in a rice swamp at this season of the year without becoming sick, and all the new hands, three in number beside myself, were taken ill within the first five days after we had entered the field. The other three were removed to the sick room, but I did not go there, choosing rather to remain at the quarter where I was my own master, except that the doctor, who called to see me, took a large quantity of blood from my arm, and compelled me to take a dose of some sort of medicine that made me very sick, and caused me to vomit violently. And this happened on the second day of my illness, and from this time I recovered slowly, but was not able to go to the field again for more than a week. Here it is but justice to my master to say that during all the time of my illness, some one came from the great house every day to inquire after me and to offer me some kind of light and cool refreshment i might have gone to the sick room at any time if i had chosen to do so an opinion generally prevails among the people of both colors that the drug caparus is very poisonous and perhaps it may be so if taken in large quantities but the circumstance that it is used in medicine seems to forbid the notion of its poisonous qualities. I believe caparis was mingled with the potion the doctor gave me. Some overseers keep caparis by them as a medicine to be administered to the hands whenever they become sick, but this I take to be a bad practice, for although in some cases this drug may be very efficacious, 
it certainly should be administered by a more skillful hand than that of an overseer. It, however, has the effect of deterring the people from complaining of illness until they are no longer able to work, for it is the most nauseous and sickening medicine that was ever taken into the stomach. Ignorant or malicious overseer may, and often do, misapply it, as was the case with our overseer, when he compelled poor Lydia to take a draught of its solution. After the restoration of my health, I resumed my accustomed labor in the field, and continued it without intermission until I left this plantation. We had this year as part of our crop ten acres of indigo. This plant is worked nearly after the manner of rice, except it's planted on high and dry ground, whilst the rice is always cultivated in low swamps where the ground may be inundated with water. But notwithstanding its location on dry ground, the culture of indigo is not less unpleasant than that of rice. When the rice is ripe and ready for the sickle, it is no longer disagreeable. But when the indigo is ripe and ready to cut, the troubles attendant upon it have only commenced. The indigo plant bears more resemblance to the weed called wild indigo, which is common in the woods of Pennsylvania, than to any other herb with which I am acquainted. The root of the indigo plant is long and slender, and emits a scent somewhat like that of parsley. From the root issues a single stem, straight hard and slender covered with a bark a little cracked on its surface of a gray color toward the bottom green in the middle reddish at the extremity and without the appearance of pith in the inside the leaves ranged in pairs around the stalk are of an oval form smooth soft to the touch furrowed above and of a deep green on the underside the upper parts of the plant are loaded with small flowers destitute of smell each flower changes into a pod enclosing seed this plant thrives best in rich moist soil the seeds are black very small and sowed in straight drills this crop requires very careful culture and must be kept free from every kind of weeds and grass it ripens within less than three months from the time it is sown and when it begins to flower the top is cut off and as new flowers appear the plant is again pruned until the end of the season. Indigo impoverishes land more rapidly than almost any other crop, and the plant must be gathered in with great caution, for fear of shaking off the valuable farina that lies in the leaves. When gathered, it is thrown into the steeping vat, a large tub filled with water, and here it undergoes a fermentation which, in twenty-four hours at farthest, is completed. A cock is then turned to let the water run into the second tub, called the mortar, or pounding tub. The steeping vat is then cleaned out, that fresh plants may be thrown in, and thus the work is continued without interruption. The water in the pounding tub is stirred with wooden buckets with holes in their bottoms for several days, and after the sediment contained in the water has settled to the bottom of the tub, the water is let off and the sediment which is the indigo of commerce, is gathered into bags and hung up to drain. It is afterwards pressed and laid away to dry in cakes, and then packed in chests for market. Washing at the tubs is exceedingly unpleasant, both on account of the filth and the stench arising from the decomposition of the plants. In the early part of June our shad, that each one had been used to receive, was withheld from us and we no longer received anything but the peck of corn and pint of vinegar. This circumstance, in a community less severely disciplined than ours, might have procured murmurs, but to us it was only announced by the fact of the fish not being distributed to us on Sunday evening. This was considered a fortunate season by our people. There had been no exemplary punishment inflicted amongst us for several months. We had escaped entirely upon the occasion of the stolen bags of cotton, though nothing less was to have been looked for on that occurrence than a general whipping of the whole gang. There was more or less of whipping amongst us every week. Frequently one was flogged every evening, over and above the punishments that followed on each settlement day. But these chastisements, which seldom exceeded ten or twenty lashes, were of little import. I was careful for my own part 
to conform to all the regulations of the plantation. When I no longer received my fish from the overseer, I found it necessary again to resort to my own expedients for the purpose of procuring something in the shape of animal food to add to my bread and greens. I had by this time become well acquainted with the woods and swamps for several miles round our plantation, and this being the season when the turtles came upon the land to deposit their eggs, I availed myself of it and going out one Sunday morning, caught in the course of the day, by travelling cautiously around the edges of the swamps, ten snapping turtles, four of which were very large. As I caught these creatures, I tied each one with hickory bark, and hung it up to the bough of a tree, so that I could come and carry it home at my leisure. I afterwards carried my turtles home, and put them into a hole that I dug in the ground, four or five feet deep and secured the sides by driving small pieces of split timber into the ground, quite round the circumference of the hole, the upper ends of the timber standing out above the ground. Into this hole I poured water at pleasure, and kept my turtles until I needed them. On the next Sunday I went again to the swamps to search for turtles, but as the period of laying their eggs had nearly passed, I had poor success today, only taking two turtles of a species called skill pots, a kind of large terrapin with a speckled back and red belly. This day, when I was three or four miles from home, in a very solitary part of the swamps, I heard the sound of bells, similar to those which wagoners place on the shoulders of their horses. At first, the noise of bells of this kind, in a place where they were so unexpected, alarmed me, as I could not imagine who or what it was that was causing these bells to ring. I was standing near a pond of water, and listening attentively. I thought the bells were moving in the woods and coming toward me. I therefore crouched down upon the ground under cover of a cluster of small bushes that were near me, and lay, not free from disquietude, to await the near approach of these mysterious bells. Sometimes they were quite silent for a minute or more at a time, and then again would jingle quick but not loud. They were evidently approaching me, and at length I heard footsteps distinctly in the leaves which lay dry upon the ground. A feeling of horror seized me at this moment, for I now recollected that I was on the verge of the swamp near where the vultures and carrion crows had mangled the living bodies of the two murderers, and my terror was not abated, when a moment after I saw come from behind a large tree the form of a brawny, famished-looking black man, entirely naked, with his hair matted and shaggy, his eyes wild and rolling, and bearing over his head something in the form of an arch, elevated three feet above his hair, beneath the top of which were suspended the bells, three in number, whose sound had first attracted my attention. Upon a closer examination of this frightful figure, I perceived that it wore a collar of iron about its neck, with a large padlock pendant from behind, and carried in its hand a long staff with an iron spear in one end. The staff, like everything else belonging to this strange spectre, was black. It slowly approached within ten paces of me, and stood still. The sun was now down and the early twilight produced by the gloom of the heavy forest in the midst of which I was added approaching darkness to heighten my dismay. My heart was in my mouth. All the hairs of my head started from their sockets. I seemed to be rising from my hiding place into the open air in spite of myself, and I gasped for breath. The black apparition moved past me, went to the water, and kneeled down. The forest re-echoed with the sound of the bells, and their dreadful peals filled the deepest recesses of the swamps as their bearer drank the water of the pond, in which I thought I heard his irons hiss when they came into contact with it. I felt confident that I was now in the immediate presence of an inhabitant of a nether and fiery world who had been permitted to escape for a time from the place of torment, and came to revisit the scenes of his former crimes. I now gave myself up for lost, without other aid than my own, and began to pray aloud to heaven to protect me. At the sound of my voice, the supposed evil one appeared to be scarcely less alarmed than I was. He sprang to his feet, and at a single bound rushed mid-deep into the water, and then turning, 
he besought me in a suppliant and piteous tone of voice to have mercy upon him and not carry him back to his master the suddenness with which we pass from the extreme of one passion to the utmost bounds of another is inconceivable and must be assigned to the catalogue of unknown causes and effects unless we suppose the human frame to be an involuntary machine operated upon by surrounding objects which gave it different and contrary impulses as a ball is driven to and fro by the batons of boys when they play in troops upon a common i had no sooner heard a human voice than all my fears fled as a spark that ascends from a heap of burning charcoal and vanishes to nothing i at once perceived that the object that had well nigh deprived me of my reason so far from having either the will or the power to injure me was only a poor destitute african negro still more wretched and helpless than myself rising from the bushes i now advanced to the water side and desired him to come out without fear and to be assured that if i could render him any assistance i would do it most cheerfully as to carrying him back to his master i was more ready to ask help to deliver me from my own than to give aid to any one in forcing him back to his we now went to a place in the forest where the ground was for some distance clear of trees and where the light of the sun was yet so strong that every object could be seen my new friend now desired me to look at his back which was seamed and ridged with scars of the whip and the hickory from the pole of his neck to the lower extremity of the spine the natural color of the skin had disappeared and was succeeded by a streaked and speckled appearance of dusky white and pale flesh color scarcely any of the original black remaining the skin of this man's back had been again and again cut away by the thong and renewed by the hand of nature until it was grown fast to the flesh and felt hard and turbid he told me his name was paul and that he was a native of congo in africa and that he had left an aged mother a widow at home as also a wife and four children and that it had been his misfortune to fall into the hands of a master who was frequently drunk and whose temper was so savage that his chief delight appeared to consist in whipping and torturing his slaves of whom he owned near twenty but through some unaccountable caprice he had contracted a particular dislike against paul whose life he now declared to me was insupportable he had then been wandering in the woods more than three weeks with no other subsistence in the land tortoises frogs and other reptiles that he had taken in the woods and along the shores of the ponds with the aid of his spear he had not been able to take any of the turtles in the laying season because the noise of his bells frightened them and they always escaped to the water before he could catch them he had found many eggs which he had eaten raw having no fire nor any means of making fire to cook his food he had been afraid to travel much in the middle of the day lest the sound of his bells should be heard by some one who would make his master acquainted with the place of his concealment the only periods when he ventured to go in search of food were early in the morning before people could have time to leave their homes and reach the swamp or late in the evening after those who were in pursuit of him had gone to their dwellings for the night the man spoke our language imperfectly but possessed a sound and vigorous understanding and reasoned with me upon the propriety of destroying a life which was doomed to continual distress he informed me that he had first run away from his master more than two years ago after being whipped with long hickory switches until he fainted and that he concealed himself in a swamp at that time ten or fifteen miles from this place for more than six months but was finally betrayed by a woman whom he sometimes visited that when taken he was again whipped until he was not able to stand and had a heavy block of wood chained to one foot which he was obliged to drag after him at his daily labor for more than three months when he found an old file with which he cut the irons from his ankle and again escaped to the woods but was retaken within little more than a week after his flight by two men who were looking after their cattle and came upon him in the woods where he was asleep on being returned to his master he was again whipped and then the iron collar that he now wore with the iron rod extending from one shoulder over his head to the other with the bells fastened at the top of the arch were put upon him of these irons he could not divest himself 
and wore them constantly from that time to the present. I had no instruments with me to enable me to release Paul from his manacles, and all I could do for him was to desire him to go with me to the place where I had left my terrapins, which I gave to him, together with all the eggs that I had found today. I also caused him to lie down, and having furnished myself with a flint stone, many of which lay in the sand near the edge of the pond, and a handful of dry moss, I succeeded in striking fire from the iron collar, and made a fire of sticks upon which he could roast the terrapins and the eggs. It was now quite dark, and I was full two miles from my road, with no path to guide me towards home but the small traces made in the woods by the cattle. I advised Paul to bear his misfortunes as well as he could until the next Sunday, when I would return and bring with me a file and other things necessary to the removal of his fetters. I now set out alone to make my way home, not without some little feeling of trepidation, as I passed along in the dark shade of the pine trees, and thought of the terrific deeds that had been done in these woods. This was the period of the full moon, which now rose and cast her brilliant rays through the tops of the trees that overhung my way, and enveloped my path in a gloom more cheerless than the obscurity of total darkness. The path I traveled led by sinuities around the margin of the swamp, and finally ended at the extremity of the cart road, terminating at the spot where David and Hardy had been given alive for food to vultures. And over this ground I was now obliged to pass, unless I chose to turn far to the left through the pathless forest, and make my way to the high road near the spot where the lady had been torn from her horse. I hated the idea of acknowledging to my own heart that I was a coward, and dared not look upon the bones of a murderer at midnight, and there was little less of awe attached to the notion of visiting the ground where the ghost of the murdered woman was reported to wander in the moonbeams than in visiting the scene where diabolical crimes had been visited by fiend-like punishment. My opinion is that there is no one who is not at times subject to a sensation approaching fear, when placed in situations similar to that in which I found myself this night. I did not believe that those who had passed the dark line, which separates the living from the dead, could again return to the earth either for good or for evil. But that solemn foreboding of the heart, which directs the minds of all men to a contemplation of the just judgment, which a superior and unknown power holds in reservation for the deeds of this life, filled my soul with a dread conception of the unutterable woes which a righteous and unerring tribunal must award to the blood-stained spirits of the two men whose lives had been closed in such unspeakable torment by the side of the path I was now treading. The moon had risen high above the trees, and shone with a clear and cloudless light. The whole firmament of heaven was radiant with the luster of a mild and balmy summer evening, save only the droppings of the early dew from the lofty branches of the trees into the water, which lay in shallow pools on my right, and the light trampling of my own footsteps, the stillness of night pervaded the lonely wastes around me. But there is a deep melancholy in the sound of the heavy drop as it meets the bosom of the wave in a dense forest at night, that revives in the memory the recollection of the days of other years, and fills the heart with sadness. I was now approaching the unhallowed ground where lay the remains of the remorseless and guilty dead, who had gone to their final account reeking in their sins, unatoned, unblessed, and unwept. Already I saw the bones, whitened by the rain and bleached in the sun, lying scattered and dispersed, a leg here and an arm there, while a skull with the under jaw in its place, retaining all its teeth, grinned a ghastly laugh, with its front full in the beams of the moon, which, falling into the vacant sockets of the eyeballs, reflected a pale shadow from these deserted caverns, and played in twinkling luster upon the bald and skinless forehead. In a moment the night breeze agitated the leaves of the wood and moaned in dreary sighs through the lofty pine tops. The gale shook the forest in the depth of the solitudes. A cloud swept across the moon, and her light disappeared. A flock of carrion crows, disturbed in their roosts, flapped their wings and fluttered over my head, 
and a wolf, who had been gnawing the dry bones, greeted the darkness with a long and dismal howl. I felt the blood chill in my veins, and all my joints shuddered as if I had been smitten by electricity. At last a minute elapsed before I recovered the power of self-government. I hastened to fly from a place devoted to crime, where an evil genius presided in darkness over a fell assembly of howling wolves and blood-snuffling vultures. When I arrived at the quarter, all was quiet. The inhabitants of this mock village were wrapped in forgetfulness, and I stole silently into my little loft and joined my neighbors in their repose. Experience had made me so well acquainted with the dangers that beset the life of a slave that I determined as a matter of prudence to say nothing to any one of the adventures of this Sunday, but went to work on Monday morning at the summons of the overseer's horn as if nothing unusual had occurred. In the course of the week I often thought of the forlorn and desponding African who had so terrified me in the woods and who seemed so grateful for the succor I gave him. I felt anxious to become better acquainted with this man, who possessed knowledge superior to the common race of slaves, and manifested a moral courage in the conversation that I had with him, worthy of a better fate than that to which fortune had consigned him. On the following Sunday, having provided myself with a large file, which I procured from the blacksmith's shop belonging to the plantation, I again repaired to the place at the side of the swamp where I had first seen the figure of this ill-fated man. I expected that he would be in waiting for me at the appointed place, as I had promised him that I would certainly come again at this time. But on arriving at the spot where I had left him, I saw no sign of any person. The remains of the fire I had kindled were here, and it seemed that the fire had been kept up for several days by the quantity of ashes that lay in a heap, surrounded by numerous small brands. The impressions of human feet were thickly disposed around this decayed fire, and the bones of the terrapins that I had given to Paul, as well as the skeletons of many frogs, were scattered upon the ground, but there was nothing that showed that any one had visited this spot since the fall of the last rain, which I now recollected had taken place on the previous Thursday. From this circumstance I concluded that Paul had relieved himself of his irons and gone to seek concealment in some other place, or that his master had discovered his retreat and carried him back to the plantation. While standing at the ashes I heard the croaking of ravens at some distance in the woods, and immediately afterwards a turkey buzzard passed over me, pursued by an eagle coming from the quarter in which I had just heard the ravens. I knew that the eagle never pursued the buzzard for the purpose of preying upon him, but only to compel him to disgorge himself of his prey for the benefit of the king of birds. I therefore concluded there was some dead animal in my neighborhood that had called all these ravenous fowls together. It might be that Paul had killed a cow by knocking her down with a pine knot, and that he had removed his residence to this slaughtered animal. Curiosity was aroused in me and I proceeded to examine the woods. I had not advanced more than two hundred yards when I felt oppressed by a most sickening stench, and saw the trees swarming with birds of prey, buzzards perched upon their branches, ravens sailing amongst their boughs, and clouds of carrion crows flitted about and poising themselves in the air in a stationary position, after the manner of the most nauseous of all birds, when it perceives, or thinks it perceives, some object of prey. Proceeding onward I came in view of a large sassafras tree, around the top of which was congregated a cloud of crows, some on the boughs and others on the wing, while numerous buzzards were sailing low and nearly skimming the ground. This sassafras tree had many low horizontal branches, attached to one of which I now saw the cause of so vast an assembly of the obscene fowls of the air. The lifeless and putrid body of the unhappy Paul, hung suspended by a cord made of twisted hickory bark, passed in the form of a halter round the neck, and firmly bound to a limb of the tree. It was manifest that he had climbed the tree, fastened the cord to the branch, and then sprung off. 
The smell that assailed my nostrils was too overwhelming to permit me to remain long in view of the dead body, which was much mangled and torn, though its identity was beyond question, for the iron collar and the bells with the arch that bore them were still in their place. The bells had preserved the corpse from being devoured, for whilst I looked at it I observed a crow descended upon it and made a stroke at the face with its beak. But the motion that this gave to the bells caused them to rattle, and the bird took to flight. Seeing that I could no longer render assistance to Paul, who was now beyond the reach of his master's tyranny, as well as of my pity, I returned without delay to my master's house and going into the kitchen related to the household servants that I had found a black man hung in the woods with bells upon him. This intelligence was soon communicated to my master, who sent for me to come into the house to relate the circumstances to him. I was careful not to tell that I had seen Paul before his death, and when I had finished my narrative, my master observed to a gentleman who was with him that this was a heavy loss to the owner, and told me to go. The body of Paul was never taken down, but remained hanging where I had seen it until the flesh fell from the bones or was torn off by the birds. I saw the bones hanging in the sassafras tree more than two months afterwards, and the last time that I was ever in these swamps. End of chapter 12